Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for another one of these uh, COVID-19 updates. A little bit different tonight. Um, in the studio, we're bringing in a whole bunch of people through Zoom and a bit upsetting. So um, I just want to remind you again, um, we've got a lot of COVID resources that are being updated constantly. So go to mrap.org. They're free to the world. And um, it's obviously a big time in our lives. It's a big time in healthcare. And I think, uh, as we all know, that this is going to sort of define you know, ourselves and our profession for uh, decades to come. I know a lot of students have been asking what can we do to help and so I just wanted to throw these two up. This is a daily COVID-19 literature surveillance summary done by a bunch of medical students uh, with some faculty that are helping out. They're going over the literature every day as there's now many hundreds of papers coming out. So if you want to be involved with this, this is one place. Um, here is, oops, here's another one. The National Student Response Network is another group of volunteer students from across the world that are helping out in any way they can in emergency departments, in doctor's offices, uh, in nursing homes, all over the place. So another place if you're a student that you want to get involved that you can. I want to do a shout out to our own Vanessa Carty who is with Jan Schonberger in the chat room and Vanessa has become an official uh, fellow of the Rural and Remote Medicine uh, group which is uh, kind of a big deal so congratulations to Vanessa. These are all the things we're going to talk about tonight so we're going to keep things moving here. We have a lot of very important people that are on the show and we've also made a big change uh, to the textbook and so uh, let's roll uh, the video. Jess couldn't be with us tonight. She's actually intubating COVID patients as we speak but she's got some updates for us. So let me give you a little update where we're at with the COVID chapter in Corpendium, which is still free for anyone to use and access. So fortunately, the major updates have started to slow down a little bit. There's a ton of stuff coming out every single day, and it's a lot to sift through to try to find, you know, what's really relevant and needs to be added to what is a beast of a chapter. But I want to introduce to you, um, we're going to have a new chapter author who's taking the lead on this for us, and that's Dr. Crystal Ives, who's really doing a fantastic job. She just just joined us just a few days ago and she's already making some really great changes to keep things current for you in the chapter. So Dr. Crystal Ives, she did med school at USC then she did her emergency medicine training at Fresno. She worked as an attending for a couple of years before she went on to do her critical care fellowship where she's just finishing that up right now at Michigan State and then she'll be rejoining us as Fresno faculty. So Crystal Ives, uh, you'll be hearing more about her and more from her as she, she stays on top of all of the updates for you in the COVID chapter. So let me tell you a few of the things that we've added and that Crystal's been leading us on in the last few days. We've added a section on pediatric considerations. Uh, fortunately, we talked about this at the last MRAP Live with Dr. Eileen Claudius. We talked about these case reports of Kawasaki disease. Well, now there's more information about an inflammatory syndrome that's very uncommon in kids, but it is being described and it shares similarities with Kawasaki disease and toxic shock syndrome. Multiple organs are involved and it can present with fever, lymphadenopathy, conjunctivitis, mucous membrane involvement, cardiac inflammation, and sometimes hypotension and shock. So that's something to be aware of, very rare, but is being described occasionally in pediatric patients. Crystal's also added a section about vaccine development. And right now it's sort of describing the different approaches that are being looked at for vaccine de um, development. And many, many vaccines are underway. Um, and so she'll be keeping that updated to see where we're at. No big news, unfortunately, about vaccines. I think we're still several months away from that. ECMO. So Crystal um, is doing her critical care fellowship and specializing in ECMO. She's managing a ton of ECMO patients right now who are COVID patients. And there is a study of over 600 patients who were on ECMO. So just a description of what happened with these 600 patients. Of the ones who required ECMO, 24% were able to be weaned off of ECMO. And of the ones weaned off, 43% survived to discharge. That's actually really reassuring that people who are sick enough to get on this place, some of them are actually surviving to discharge from the hospital. And these are managed on venovenous ECMO, and that's for hypoxic respiratory failure. So we'll be keeping more ECMO updates available for you in the chapter. And then finally, a little bit of the pharmacology. We've added a couple um, uh, treatments that are possibilities here. IL-1 antagonist, so Anna Kinra is an IL-1 antagonist that may show some survival benefit in patients with moderate to severe ARDS. 
more to come on that. And JAK inhibitors are also under further investigation. We've talked about on MRAP Live in the past. I'm going to leave the rest of the pharmacology and further details about that, though, to Dr. Sean Nort. So um, we'll be keeping the chapter as updated as we possibly can. And hopefully you'll hear more from Crystal Ives as, as she continues to do an awesome job leading us um, and keeping on top of the immense amount of information that comes at us on a daily basis about COVID. So thanks, Jess. Um, this slide is a reminder that this is a serious disease. And as we said at the beginning, and I think it was Dave Talon said, it's during a pandemic, you need to go slow in order to go fast. So you must protect yourselves. We're actually just talking behind the scenes here about uh, some faculty members that have actually died from this disease. So take your time. This is just another reminder for me. Also, this is a great book. I just sort of discovered this a, a little while ago, and the you know, it's all about the 1918 pandemic, and it's about medicine at the time. And if you want a good read or a good listen, this has got some um, fantastic stuff in it that are really pertinent to what is happening right now. And these are just some of the images from 1918 where they just ran out of space. Man, they just put people together. But it is interesting, and I think I've said it before, that the patients that were nursed outside in the tents were doing much better than the people that were in the hospital and some of the ID people were thinking it's just because there was lots of airflow and ultraviolet light and maybe the viral load was lower. So I want to bring in uh, Britt now. Britt Guest is a fellow at uh, UCLA and Britt is going to do uh, a poll for us and we'll see if this thing's going to work. So Britt, you can share your screen. All right. Let's see if this works. It's probably going to fail, but don't worry. It's okay. No <laughs> pressure. Let's see. Okay. So um, if you guys want to participate in this poll we're basically you know obviously covid has had a huge pack on impact on every part of our life and we're trying to figure out how we're going to gather in the future for academic conferences like asap so if you could text so using the phone number 2233 text the word mrap 22333 22333 text the word mrap to that number and then once you've texted MRAP to that number, you've joined the poll and you put A for yes, I'm ready to go to ASAP in October, no for no way, I think there's going to be too high of a risk of COVID, and then C, wait and see. So ASAP, I know, sent out a huge poll a couple of days ago um, asking some questions about this, but um, we got permission to ask it as well, because I'm very interested in this to see how many emergency physicians want to get into a space with about six to 10,000 other emergency physicians not wearing N95 masks and uh, donning and doffing. So um, we're just interested in um, right now how people are feeling about it. And it's interesting looking at this poll in real time. Um, it's looking like most people right now are not interested in going or Maybe gonna we wait could add see. option option D. Yes, I'll go if I can wear a pepper. <laughs> it should have done that. You should have <laughs> put it in the pepper. All right. So uh, that's really interesting stuff to me. Um, let's move on to the next part of the show, which is words that Stuart uses that you don't use and you don't know. Roll the tape. Well, it's time to do another of these in the series: words that Stuart uses that you don't know. And this one is quaternary. You might know it as quaternary. You'd be wrong, but you might know it as that. Which of course means, you know, to turn in place up to four times. Except that's not what it means. And let me read here from the Google. It says, uh, fourth in order or rank belonging to the fourth order. Which of course means that you're part of a bizarre religious sect. Right? Quaternary. Hmm. Religious sect. Words that Stuart uses, you don't know. All right. I know. Hysterically funny, right? Incredibly good. Um, we now get to the section where we get reports from the field. I find this really interesting because I want to know what's going on um, because we don't have so much of it here in California right now, but that might be changing a little bit. But before we get to the live speakers, we put together a little video from some people across the world to give us some quick updates. So let's roll that video. Hey, everyone. Hi from Berlin. Um, what has, what's COVID been like for our projects? For the most part, it's been getting ready for the wave. Uh, we've had very few projects that are seeing suspect cases yet, 
We've had some positive cases in Afghanistan. Thankfully, those patients have been young and they've done well. Um, we've had some suspected cases in Nigeria and Kenya. I just talked to a doc that came back from Iraq yesterday, and, uh, and those have, they've also had some suspected cases, but no positives. Um, part of that is also where we have access to testing. But uh, yeah, mostly it's been trying to anticipate what COVID's going to be like for the populations that we're serving. So, you know, a large pediatric population, but with severe malnutrition and, um, and a real need to be able to continue doing vaccination campaigns and, and things like that. Um, and, and of course, we worry a lot about the refugee populations that we serve in, in, uh, in context where social distancing is obviously much trickier. So um, also looking at what interventions are going to be realistic for our projects to put in place. We've been also looking at prone positioning with a lot of interest and recommending that. Um, so, so yeah, that's pretty much what things have been like here. Um, thanks for, for all the live updates. It's been super useful. It's been great to see all the folks from UCLA. Um, big shout out to the folks on the Navajo and Hopi reservations. Uh, my thoughts have been with you and I was hoping to be there with you myself at the end of the month, but uh, yeah, thanks for my friends for, uh, for, for picking up those shifts. So uh, yeah, we expect we're gonna know quite a bit more in the next four to eight weeks. That's when we expect the wave is gonna be hitting most of our projects. And, uh, and in the meantime, we're, we're trying to do what we can to get ready. All right, thanks a lot. I'm Dave Herbert. I'm an emergency trainee in Sydney, Australia. And uh, yeah, I was asked to give a little update about how things are going in Australia and I have to say things are not too bad uh, at all. We've been on some sort of lockdown here since around about the sort of Friday the 13th of March and uh, the, some of those restrictions have started to relax and there's some more news coming about that for us shortly. Uh, and a little bit of sort of media talk about us having pretty much squashed the curve as opposed to flattening it, which we're pretty pleased about. It's not all completely over and we're still getting somewhere around about 20 cases throughout the whole country, state and territories all combined. But the news is basically pretty good. We've got, I'm just looking at the official figures right now, we've got 6,896 corona cases that have been recorded with 97 deaths. Um, and in general, I think it's probably fair to say that around the country, uh, emergency presentations in general are down as people are out and about less and uh, potentially getting into less trouble. So things are good. Uh, everybody's doing what they have to do in terms of the lockdowns. I hope you are all doing well over there. I know that it's certainly been much harder in some places than here. So good luck. I'm a, a critical care fellow at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, and luckily for us, the Ann Arbor area was not hit particularly hard. A lot of our patients were um, transferred from De Detroit hospitals as they became overwhelmed for ECMO evaluations. Um, I would say we saw our peak a couple of weeks ago. Um, and at one point we had nine people on ECMO in our surgical ICU, which was almost a record. 10 is the record. But luckily, we've been able to decannulate most of those people. There's a couple still on. Um, and I think things have really started to slow down as far as transfers. We're still getting some. We had a couple just yesterday, um, but not nearly the numbers we were seeing a couple weeks ago. Fresno is starting to see a slow increase in the number of cases identified every day, but overall, the cumulative total is still pretty low. We have 885 total cases as of today, and fortunately, we only have nine deaths, which are still tragic, but that number is pretty low for us. Of that 885 identified cases, about 130 of them were ever hospitalized. We've run over 10,000 tests in Fresno County, and the 
the hospital where I work is able to run about 500 tests per day. So that's pretty good. Now we are seeing cases. Personally, I'm really not seeing very many at all, but we do have cases. We have about 30 patients in our ICU right now. And we have a lot of beds available in the hospital, in the ICU. We have a lot of ventilators available. We are definitely not surging. So that's really good news. PPE is not have it. We are protected. We're being very cautious and conservative about it, but no one's reusing masks 15 times. Like we can get a clean mask and we try to just, I, I try to wear the same mask for the whole shift unless it needs to be changed for some particular reason. Everyone is wearing masks all the time when in the hospital or anywhere on the premises of the hospital. And we're doing, we're about to start implementing into work. So as you can see, different parts of the thing you've done. I also talked to Ben Wachira in Kenya, and unfortunately the audio on the video quality was very bad. And uh, he's at Aga Khan in Nairobi, um, but there are large slums in Nairobi, so there's a lot of concern. So let's bring Evie and Anand, and first up with Evie, who's in New Hampshire. Evie, what's happening uh, in your neck of the woods? Did you see a lot? What's going on? And unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Mel. Yes. Sorry. No we did not see a lot. We kept waiting for the surge. We feel like we're looking over our shoulders, keep waiting for the surge, and they're predicting now we might see it in the fall. Um, the numbers in our hospital are pretty low. And in New Hampshire, the larger numbers are in the southern part where there's more densely populated areas. In our ED, though, our volumes are increasing, as is the acuity. And um, we're able to test all our patients with um, a very nice test that comes back in about three to four hours, depending on when you send it. And one of the, one of the perks that we've noticed in this uh, pandemic is that our psychiatric services are stepping up to the plate. We used to have a lot of psych borders, and now our psychiatric patients come in and uh, psychiatry is admitting them. And it's a luxury that we are getting used to, and we're not going to want to give up when this is over. So um, we're just waiting for the surge, and we're ready for it. Great. Swami, uh, we've been following you um, for eight weeks. Where are you now? We're about two weeks off of the peak of the surge, I think, at this point. So we have really seen our numbers fall quite a bit. Uh, incoming, our COVID patients, I think today, as of today, we still have 60 intubated COVID patients in the hospital between our main hospital and then our outline community shop. Uh, so we still have about 60 intubated patients. We have probably about a, a good number of uh, vents. I think when we started doing this about six weeks ago, we were down in the single digit vents. We are well into the 50, 60 vents available. I saw a CPAP machine for the first time in a month recently. So that was uh, very heartwarming. I hugged it. I, I held it close. And I came home with it just in case I needed it later. But we're we're definitely seem to be on the downswing. What we're really struggling with now is trying to figure out ways to get our volume back up and not just the ED volume, but the overall hospital volume. How do we reopen the operating rooms? How do we reopen for elective cases, for elective admissions or semi-elective admissions? And that's uh, been a real struggle, especially the patients who are coming in who need to go to the OR. We have a hospital policy that we're trying to get all of the patients tested for COVID so we can cohort within the hospital now that we are down off that 100% COVID penetrance. And our tests don't come back that fast. So depending on what time of day they're sent and where the lab is in batching things, sometimes the test comes back in four hours. Sometimes it's 12 to 16. So um, we're, we're trying to figure out how do we keep our hospital open and get some revenue back in so that we can keep things moving along. But um, we do, we are seeing our patients start to come back. So over the weekend, I was on nights and we saw some of our classic trauma. So we had uh, falls out of windows and gunshot wounds and stab wounds and car accidents. So I don't want to be too dark and say that it was heartwarming to see regular trauma, but I've never seen our trauma team so happy to see trauma patients. Um, they are very happy to be out of the NICU, to stop managing ventilators on a frequent basis and start to do some regular old trauma again. So some some normalcy is returning. It's hard to get our, our heads around the fact that some places like yours crushed, other places uh, not much going on. Turns out it's an infectious disease that gets uh, passed from person to person and that can be different in different places. Um, Dave Schreiger and I got to talk to some Swedes. Like um, there's this big 
um, thing going on in Europe where the Swedes are basically, in theory, not uh, shutting things down as much, letting the young people go out. Um, they're just trying to protect the old people. We did a much longer video than we're about to show, which we'll post in the next day or two that explains sort of everything that's going on there. But this is going to be a setup to, for Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Schreiger to talk about. So let's play the video now, a very shortened version. So we've established that you don't have this extra capacity, which we thought you must have, that you're running full. So what happened in the hospitals? Give us that picture. What happened generally that the main problem was in Stockholm because we had the most patients uh, in the beginning and still have the most patients, uh, was that more or less everything planned when it came to surgery and orthopedics stopped. So due to that, the wards opened up lots of places that the elected patients didn't need to come in. So we could fill them with uh, COVID patients. And, uh, and then they stepped up with the uh, ICU places. We tripled our ICU places within two weeks in Stockholm. Increase your ICU capacity threefold, but did you get overwhelmed with patients? No. no. <laughs> Generally, you can say everybody uh, got 15 to 30% less patients to the EDs. And the, the, the patient types totally changed. Was majority was corona patients. And the other patients just disappeared. We don't know where. Uh, we have lots of registries in, in Sweden. One of them is the heart registry that registers different things. And they have noticed 40% less registries uh, during this time. And we don't know where those 40% of patients went. They're just not coming to the EDs anymore. Mm. And also we, we have an, uh, at least a, a budding emergency medicine registry, which has about 40% coverage on the national level at this at this time and we can see that general number of visits has decreased with about 25 percent since the beginning of march um, if you compare it to last year uh, another thing that uh, we did is that the general practitioners which uh, they have a, a very big uh, part of the uh, the health care of the, the patients in our country uh, and they have been preparing old patients, taking time to prepare them. So uh, old patients that came in and often got something done that perhaps could have been done at home in their homes, elderly homes, uh, they were prepared so that the nurses could do what they needed at home. In the medical community, as best you can tell, what is the reaction to your country choosing to take a, a lighter touch putting more responsibility on citizens for using good judgment and less structural changes to society. Is, is the medical com community applauding that or worried about it in terms of its consequences on, um, on the death rate or workloads? Or what, what's the general sense? I think the general sense is positive because so far we have been able to manage the inflow of patients uh, and be, it's different, different in different regions, uh, as Aaron say. But so far in our region, uh, I think the approach has functioned because we have had reserve capacity uh, to take more patients if it's necessary. It has been on the limit with the ICU units uh, some days. But so far, I think the strategy has worked very well. When, when Americans ask, because usually it's, it's difficult to know how, how big a country is, I, I usually say that Sweden is the size of California. Uh, but the population is about the, the, the same as New York City. So you spread out New York City in all of California, which creates a lot of natural space mm. between cities, between towns, and also between people. So there are only a few places in Sweden where you actually have this really urban population density, which I think also naturally creates less opportunities for dispersion of, of something contagious. Now, as I say, a much longer version of that will be up on the website soon. It's really interesting. So this gives me an opportunity to bring in Dave Schreiger, who you all know very well. And there's another guy with him called Professor Jerry Hoffman. We have had an overwhelming number of people asking us to get Jerry on here to give us his thoughts and words. So, gentlemen, take it away. Thank you, Mel. And welcome, Jerry. It, it's hey, uh, you, an Dave. honor and privilege to have one of my mentors uh, on the show with us today. And and really the, the only mentor I have who remembers the uh, 1918 influenza <laughs> pandemic. Um, so why don't we start by, uh, what was your reaction to the video we just saw about Sweden? 
Well, I, I think Sweden's very interesting. You know, let me start off by saying that there's a lot that we don't know. And I think any of us who tries to make overwhelming statements about what is or should be, et cetera, you know, is, is overstepping. We, there, we, we have to make our best guesses, but uh, I'm very interested in what they're doing in Sweden. We have to be cautious, as they pointed out, and as I, I've heard you say, not to equate Sweden to the U.S. There are so many things that are tremendously different between the two places that if we try to do in a haphazard and stupid way what they're doing very carefully, we probably get very different results. But I, I think it's important to be thinking about and talking about what they've suggested, which is that maybe it's not the best thing in the world to lock everybody down. Yeah. And, and I, I want to emphasize that I agree with you that every situation is specific and generalities here will get people into trouble. And there's so much we don't understand at this point. But, um, you know, it's interesting. You hear some pe people saying, look at Sweden, look at Norway. Norway, a couple hundred deaths. You know, Sweden, thousands of deaths, um, even accounting for the population. It's about a tenfold difference. And I think, you know, you and I were having a conversation that uh, it's hard to know if we're witnessing, well, it's not that hard to know, but in theory, one could be witnessing a 100 meter race, a sprint, or they could be watching a marathon. And, you know, there's some wishful thinking that, um, you know, the weather will change and the disease will go away, or a vaccine will come much faster than any vaccine ever produced in history, which would make this more like a sprint. Uh, but there's a lot of reason to believe that this is going to be more like a marathon. And the importance of that, of course, is, is, is if, you're, if you're calling the race, uh, the person who's ahead by 10 meters uh, one second into a 100-meter uh, dash may well win the race. And on that basis, you say, look, Norway versus Sweden, Norway has many fewer deaths. They won. But if this is a marathon, the guy or gal who jumps out first and is way ahead at mile one, uh, there's a good bit that they won't be ahead at the end. And so if we're viewing it that way, we really cannot say whether Sweden's strategy is better, worse, or, or the same as any other country's strategy. And it may well be, I mean, what counts at the end is, you know, one of the dangers of this is that all of our graphs so far tend to start at the beginning of the pandemic. And in fact, the graph we really need to look at is one that begins at the, that starts on the right side with the end of the pandemic, meaning when a country has reached herd immunity. And it's at that point where you need to look at the deaths and look at the other costs to the system, both health-wise and otherwise, to figure out whose strategy worked best for them. So that um, I wonder what your reaction is to that. Well, you know, obviously I agree. And I think, um, so I tend to think that we're, that extreme reactions in either direction are stupid. And I think we're probably made, uh, erring on the side of uh, closing things down too much. That's my best guess. I, I'm going to explain why I think that in a minute. I, I don't want to be glib about it. But um, so I, what, you, what you're saying reminds me of the notion that um, I think people are misunderstanding the concept of flattening the curve. Everybody, when it was first explained, I think everybody understood that it wasn't intended to decrease the number of people who got infected or the number of people who died. It was to make those, those infections and those deaths be spread out so that we could deal with them better, that they didn't all come in at once and therefore overwhelm our healthcare system and overwhelm many of the other things that uh, we need to rely on. And so we would spread them out. What we're doing now is acting as though, well, if we if we keep everybody uh, separate from each other and nobody's getting infected right now, we will ultimately have fewer deaths and fewer infections. And as you point out, unless there's something magical that occurs, like a vaccine or a cure or something like that, which I think is extremely unlikely, that's not going to happen. We're eventually going to have just as many people get infected. Which takes me to the second point. Um, I've heard people say, well, when you don't know the answer, and we don't know the answer, we can, nobody else can say for sure what's best. Be safe. Do the safest thing. Do no harm. And I, I think this is a misunderstanding. Um, that is, uh, do no harm is an important concept if it means, if it's being used to mean, don't do an intervention as though interventions can only help. A lot of interventions can hurt. And with drugs, for example, new drugs, it's important to know before we start using them, are they really useful or are they going to cause harm? But in this case, it has a different meaning. It, it pretends 
that one of the two strategies, and again, I'm using these as extremes and there shouldn't be an extreme, but a strategy of staying at home and everybody being locked down and separated and a strategy of just let everybody be open and, and some in between strategy as, as though um, those are, first of all, those are not the only two strategies, but as though one of them is safer. And it, it's clear to me that there is no safe strategy and there is no way to do no harm. We will, as long as this virus is around, until we have a herd immunity or until we have some magical cure, this virus is going to infect, is going to infect people and af affect us. And it does it in two ways. One is the direct effect of the virus itself, the medical effect, where fortunately most of that is in people who, are, who remember the Spanish epidemic like I do. Um, and most young people will not get very sick, not every, not zero, but most young people won't get very sick. That's one way it causes harm. The second way it causes harm, and when I say harm, I don't just mean touchy-feely harm. I don't just mean uh, economic harm. I mean deaths, medical harm. The other way it does that is by disrupting our economy and our society. And um, the COVID virus, uh, has everybody knows, has affected marginalized people, uh, uh, communities of color, for example, poor people, more than it has privileged white people. Well, the economic effects will also do that. They will also dramatically affect poor people, people who need to work for a living more than they will people of privilege. And so I'm very worried, not about what happens to Wall Street, I don't care about that, but I'm worried about the economy because millions of people losing their jobs will cause millions of deaths or cause many, many deaths. And the tremendous social disruption that we're seeing will also cause deaths. So before we, as you say, we got to get to the end before we start counting up. But unfortunately, we can't start at the end. So we have to make our best estimates now. And I guess I'll, I'll make one other point, which is that it's shocking to me that this seems to have become a political discussion. If you're, if you're progressive, you say everybody should stay at home. And if you're right wing, you say open up everything. That's crazy. It has nothing to do with your politics. It has to do with evidence and medicine. And so again, I worry. I don't know what the answer is, where to set it up. I know we're doing a lot of things wrong that we could do better for sure, um, as they do in Sweden. But I, I am worried that a policy that says we all stay home as long as there's a virus out there is actually in the end, as many people will get infected and there'll be greater harm from the other, from the, the secondary effects. In, and I believe we need to start thinking about how are we gonna get towards where we actually do have herd immunity. All excellent points. And, um, you know, I think that as we model this, it's a mistake to model deaths. What you really wanna model is preventable deaths. So that um, it is very difficult for healthcare practitioners to experience preventable deaths. Just as we are aware that during non-COVID times, we work very hard to improve our quality to minimize the collateral damage of the practice of medicine. It is very difficult for us to bear witness to situations where less people would have died if circumstances were different. So I think that as we model the future of this, what we really need to be looking at as a metric is preventable deaths. There are going to be deaths. It's inevitable. No matter how you do this, there are going to be deaths. Absolutely. The question is, can you minimize the number of preventable deaths? And as we look at modeling the next phase of this, that really has to be, to my mind, the societal metric is to minimize preventable deaths. Right. Because ultimately, that will be the measure of how we do as a society. I worry as well that when things do open a little bit, there'll be a report of somebody dying or more people dying. That's going to happen. There's going to be a, a little bit of a surge. And then everybody will say, well, clearly we shouldn't be doing this. And that's not so clear. The question is, we, how do we get through this the best so that at the end we're at the best? I, I'd like to make a couple of other uh, sort of brief points. Um, one is, uh, I, I'd like to say that the term social distancing to me is is a bad term. Um, and I. This is a lead into what we can learn from this and how we can actually maybe get some benefit from what we've learned for the future. Uh, so social, we're, we're, when we talk about social distancing, we're not really talking about that. We're talking about physical distancing. And I think now more than ever, we should know the importance of social connection. 
that when you go to the supermarket and you see your neighbor, you shouldn't be looking down at your shoes because they're so dangerous. You should make eye contact. You know, you can't do what you ordinarily might do, but we need to see each other as in this together and as a community. And again, you know, times of crisis, uh, bad things happen. Besides the crisis itself, it's a place where other societal changes can be really bad. And in all crises, we see the best of human beings and the worst of human beings. I hope we will start to see better aspects of us because of this crisis. And one of those things is that we start to recognize that we are all in this together. And we start to recognize that if we don't start acting like a community, we're gonna be much worse off. That we need each other, we need government, we don't need bad government, <laughs> but we need to be, to be able to get together and rely on what we as a group do for us as a group. We're more obvious than that, than healthcare for that. Um, you know, we have this horrible system where uh, healthcare is about profit instead of about a human right and a human necessity. And I, from this, as a society, is to insist that everybody gets the healthcare they need, not the excess of healthcare that we see all the time, but that healthcare is a, is a right and that it should be for all of us and it shouldn't be about making money off of it. That's one of the things we can learn and as well as the others that that I, I mentioned. And I think we see that in, in talking to the, the doctors from Sweden that there are advantages to having a planned healthcare system at times like at all times, but particularly at times like this, where they are actually able to plan and manage as opposed to tr trusting the market to do that. Cause this is not something the market is, the free market is good at doing. We're, um, you know, this is, we only have a, a few minutes and I don't want to sound glib. And this is, these are really sound bites. Uh, these are complicated things we're talking about. I, I just worry that we seem to be painting this as black and white, that either you're in the camp of one or the other, and that you should base what which camp you're in on uh, based on your political beliefs, which I think is absolutely crazy. I think we need to do better. We obviously need to have leadership that is interested in the truth and is interested in science and data. Maybe that's another thing we'll learn from this, that you can't just make up reality and pretend that it is just because you keep saying it, but that there actually is a virus out there and we have to deal with it. Um, I hope we will, um, I hope we will, I'm worried about what we're doing. I'm worried that we're becoming too reductionist about this. And I hope we will be able to discuss the importance of thinking about what's the best, what's our best guess of what we should do. Very well said. And on that note, Mel, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, thanks, gentlemen. Um, we could talk about this for many hours and maybe we will offline and record it and have more discussion. The idea that what we need here is a brush fire um, to let it burn but not overwhelm the healthcare system is what we started talking about at the beginning. It's a really tough thing to do because it can quickly go from brush fire to forest fire. So you need some testing and you need some stuff that we just don't do very well yet. Actually, do a survey again. Um, so, Britt, can you share your screen and let's see if we can do this. I want to ask the question again. Now we've had, uh, and you're muted, Britt. Britt? Um, Pam? Oh, no. Yeah, there you are. So, Hello. See, if, see if you take the, I want to just see if there's that sort of discussion, the logical discussion from the elderly smart uh, men, change people's minds very much. So, this is absolutely not scientific at all, but there you go. So same phone number. Um, if you haven't done it already, you'll have to text MRAP to that number. And then A, B, or C. Um, given what you know today and maybe partially what you just heard from, from Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Schreiger, does that affect how you feel about going to ASAP in October? Um, and maybe just after hearing from those two people, it might change some of our minds a bit. And already there's a lot more people saying yes, they would go. Look at the power of these guys. It's unbelievable. <laughs> this... You changed it from 8% to 20. <laughs> it's huge. Uh, so okay. interesting. Um, I thought that there might be some effect of um, that discussion, and there it is. All right, I want to go to another professor from UCLA, and that would be Professor Talon, who's uh, well known to everybody on this show. And Dave, uh, there's two papers I asked you to look at and to, to chat about. So the first one was about this changing um, the mutation. So I think we've got like 14 various types now. One of them is said to become actually more infectious or more spreadable. 
And I was just wanting to know what's happened in past pandemics. I always thought that things got less worse over time. What's the data? And yeah, probably... so this, so I'm unmuted now, aren't I? Hi, yeah, everybody. Everybody wants to see my Russian doll. This is Anna. I know you've been looking at her the whole time. <laughs> um, yeah, that paper that you mentioned got a lot of press that suggested that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is mutating and becoming more transmissible. This was work done at the um, Los Alamos National Laboratory, which Jerry will remember as evil, but now they've turned their work for good and not evil, apparently. But although they are spreading this rumor that they've discovered a minor mutation in this virus from having been sent thousands of viral specimens and, do, and doing genetic sequencing, they found a minor mutations, and then they tracked the mutations to see if they increased in frequency from the moment they were detected, and then spread geographically. And their, their theory is that if a mutation led to a, a virus mutation multiplying and being spread geographically, it must have a survival advantage, and it, and it could be more transmissible. And indeed, they found a specific minor mutation in the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. The spike protein apparently is very important to the virus pathogenicity entering the cell. And it is such an important target that antibodies that are directed against the spike protein are neutralizing and presumably protective. Um, there are over 60 vaccine candidates, and most of them target this spike protein. So uh, the report generated a lot of interest and worry. They demonstrated that um, the specific mutation, which is called D614G, um, uh, emerged, spread through Europe, became the predominant strain worldwide. And uh, and it's either greater transmissibility or pathogenicity. They weren't able to demonstrate that. All they were able to demonstrate is this association. And so we don't really know if that's cause and effect. It's sort of like uh, the saying, you know, it, it rained the night before. Where'd Jerry go? Where's, where's Jerry? He's probably went to oh, there he is. There he is, yeah, there he is. <laughs> he can't talk. He's muted. <laughs> Anyhow, you know, it, it rained the night before and then you woke up and saw frogs on your lawn. And so you conclude that it, it rained frogs. So again, there, there, um, there's this association of increased frequency of finding strains with this mutation and emergence uh, around the world, suggesting that the virus has importantly clinically or epidemiologically changed. Um, and there's no real way to know that. Um, it's intriguing. I mean, I think all of us kind of wonder, Swami, why your experience in, in New York City and New Jersey is so much different than the experience in Sweden or California. Um, is, is the virus easier to pass? Is it more dangerous? Um, we can't tell that from this type of analysis, but um, you know, it, it, you know per, perhaps you could imagine that the virus through selective pressure you know, could start to behave differently. We don't have any proof of that. So that's, that is the uh, first article. And the and, second yes. one I'm showing now actually to everybody, which is antibody responses uh, to patients with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And now, uh, this is the big question. Well, two big questions is the serological testing, but also if you get this, can I get it again? Does this paper help us with it? I'm always like looking at these papers and it's nothing about Chinese names, but they have like 50 authors on these papers. I'm like, how do they do that? There is one author for every antibody test, as far as I can tell. So, so this, this article is somewhat interesting. So they, they tested a large number of patients and can confirm COVID-19 by PCR. They don't discuss how many PCR tests they did, but they, they come out right away and they say, we have 285 patients with compatible illness that is confirmed by PCR. We don't know how many PCR specimens or where the specimens were obtained. And in every single case of those 285, they detected IgM and IgG after about two weeks. So it appeared that with their specific serological assay, it was very sensitive to PCR confirmed COVID-19 infection. Um, 
And then um, they reported on about 50, 54 patients who had compatible symptoms, but in the, through PCR testing were PCR negative. And in those 54 patients, only four patients were they able to detect um, IgG, which could be a false positive or, or could represent um, uh, COVID-19 illness that wasn't detected by PCR, which we've seen before. The, it's sort of hard to tell. These tests kind of appear to be self-validating, but I would say at least based on what they report, whereas in the past we thought that serology might be helpful in, in confirming a PCR negative diagnosis, at least in this series it wasn't. It also appears that at least their serological test is pretty reliable in terms of its sensitivity to detect confirmed cases. Now then they also followed about 160 contacts of these confirmed cases, and they found, I think, 20 um, to have evidence of COVID-19. Uh, most were symptomatic, about two-thirds. About one-third weren't symptomatic, and a small portion of the asymptomatic cases uh, were either detected by PCR or by serology. But every case that was PCR positive, just like in the symptomatic cases, was antibody positive. I think one of the questions we're getting from patients is, and from friends is, should I have my blood tested and see if I'm one of those maybe a quarter to a third of patients who may be asymptomatic or persons, uh, a quarter to a third of persons who haven't had any symptoms but uh, may have contracted disease and may have developed antibodies which may or may not be protective. And I think we talked about this a little bit uh, a couple of MRAPs ago. These tests have to be have nearly perfect specificity. Otherwise, when you're testing a, a low prevalence population, you're much more likely to get unreliable results and false positives. This test, although you know we don't have exactly the type of background testing and information to, to tell about sensitivity and specificity, appears to be very good. And there are some now FDA approved tests like the Abbott test, which has extremely good accuracy. So, um, I mean, I, I think it's a reasonable question if, if people want, want to explore that, but probably serology testing is best used for targeted seroprevalence uh, investigations. Thanks, Dave. There was a number of questions about the different tests. There is a number of these, and they are widely different. You can go check our textbook. Uh, Abbott was one that's good. Roche appears to be good. There's a bunch that are not good, so you need to know which one you're using as to do, you know, what to do with that information. So I want to hand off to Stuart now, who's going to talk about some of the updates on the neurological manifestations with Evie Michelini. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Mel. So we're going to bring back uh, Evie Michelini. Just to remind you, she's an associate professor uh, up at Dartmouth in New Hampshire. She's also a neurocritical care specialist. Um, and uh, I have one initial question for you, Evie, which is what is the deal with 35-year-olds without risk factors coming in with large vessel occlusions. What is going on? And why? Uh, yeah, I knew you were going to ask that. Um, we don't know if stroke is associated with COVID-19 because of increased inflammation, or should we be seeing the same stroke burden as we always have, even though all of our stroke numbers are down? We do know that inflammation and thrombosis are associated with cardiovascular disease, with ARDS, with sepsis. And yeah, we've seen these large vessel occlusions in young people with absolutely no risk factors. So we know that inflammation and cytokines play a role in forming clots. So why shouldn't this be true with COVID-19 patients? Well, that's being studied in the world of neurology. Um, the Neurocritical Care Society has an international registry. They've got over 17 countries and 65 um, entities uh, adding to this registry, and they're looking at figuring out questions like this. Um, and you know, the other big question, Stuart, is where did all the strokes go? Our numbers are way down. We don't know where they are. Are they sitting at home? Are they not coming in uh, or? Or what's well, happening? I think a lot of them. I think a lot of them aren't coming in, and I think it's there's a similar uh, situation with, with the STEMIs, and we're gonna we're gonna touch on that as well a bit. Um, but until we know, uh, we have to deal with it. And so, uh, you know, I was at a talk. I was at uh, a 
ground rounds the other day and the stroke neurologist that was presenting was basically talking about how do we deal with stroke and COVID patients? And he was saying, look, we've got our three hour window. We've got the four point hour, 4.5 hour window. And we've got, you know, a thrombectomy up until possibly 24 hours. And I thought to myself, are we talking about COVID? Is specifically here, or are we just talking about stroke in general? It didn't seem like anything was different. Um, things are different, Abby. Tell us how they're different. Yeah, we, we definitely have a, a nuanced ad- approach to stroke now. And um, we have to put in the forefront PPE. Um, and there's a nice American Heart Association paper that is out that just very straightforward says this is how we should deal with stroke now in the time of pandemic. First of all, every stroke code patient should be treated as a potentially infected with COVID-19. And that means we need to don the PPE as we would with any other potentially infected person. And that has to take precedence over our times. We should use stuff like telemedicine and any other uh, tricks that we can to address these patients safely from our perspective, as well as effectively treat them for stroke. Now, when we talk about patient selection, we talk about treatment times, door to drug, door to needle, um, and all the the timing that you were hearing about, um, those are goals. And in the time of pandemic, they are just that, they're goals. They're not expectations. And we have to take a step back from that to take into account what's important. What's important is that we do things safely and we don't rush in to to hurry up and forget about the fact that we are in a pandemic now that kind of reminds us of that uh, of the nurse that uh, mel talked about at the beginning who rushed into that code blue without ppe that's what i keep thinking about exactly yeah and um there's a couple other things uh Typically, patients who have had thrombolysis or thrombectomy have been going to the neuro ICU in many institutions, not all of them, but in many of them. And um, what we're we're recognizing and acknowledging now is that that's not really evidence-based. And what we do is we put them in the ICU, we watch them for changes, we watch them for uh, bleeds or progression of stroke and, and, and to do something about that if we can. We don't need to do that. Now we recognize that those ICUs are precious commodities, as are the folks who are running them. And so we save those for those more critically ill patients. And we're putting our patients in the step down or in the floor. And we're still watching their neuro exam. We still want to know what's going on with them, but we don't have to put them in the ICUs anymore. And the bottom line really is to get the word out to the public, stroke is still a time sensitive problem. And it warrants a call to the physician at least. If not, just come into the emergency department. It's a safe place. We could take care of you. And um, these are issues that we want you to come to the emergency department for. Absolutely. So um, just a couple of questions that are uh, very common about imaging. Um, You've got a patient being transferred into you. Uh, The CT scanner is something that everyone is very concerned about as a a potential uh, place of transmission. Uh, Also, should we be scanning these patients like their chest as well to see if they've got COVID at the same time? What's the latest on how we image these patients? Yeah, those are great questions. There's another nice guideline that was recently put out by the Heart Association. It addresses mechanical thrombectomy. But if you look at part of that, it, 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 it tells us what we should be doing for imaging. And the first point is, if you have a patient coming in for stroke and you're sending them to the CT for brain imaging, scan their chest at the same time, as long as it doesn't delay their care or delay their imaging for more than five minutes. Now, if the patient is transferred to you from an outside hospital and they already have their brain imaging and you don't need brain imaging, don't send them to the scanner just to get chest imaging. But the point is, if they're in there, get the chest as well. And we're doing this at our institution. We're trying to to say, I'm going to image my patient's if it's going to change my management, change what I do. But if the patient's already in there getting a brain image, I'm going to scan their chest, especially if they're elderly or if we're thinking to rule them out for COVID or if we're suspicious for it, because it's a very short test and and we can get that. The second part of imaging is if CT perfusion is part of your institution's protocol, get it initially at the same time that you're getting a CT and CTA. Now, previously, I've said, and and we all have said, 
be judicious with your imaging. Get a CT, get a CTA if you think it's needed and there's different criteria to use that. But in this time, if you have a patient with stroke symptoms, get the imaging you need instead of going back and forth. And the third part is when we talk about stroke patients, we've got systemic thrombolysis and mechanical thrombectomy. And we have, as you know, Stuart, gone beyond the four and a half hour window to have protocols that suggest we can do mechanical thrombectomy on patients six to 24 hours out from their last seen normal. And that's from the DAWN trial. And you, you remember the DAWN trial looked at mechanical thrombectomy for acute ischemic stroke in patients who had ICA or MCA. And what they looked at was the NIH stroke scale and compared that to imaging like a DWI or a CT perfusion. So if the clinical stroke was significantly larger than the size of the infarct that we saw on that imaging, those patients would benefit from mechanical thrombectomy. So now if you are in an institution where you don't have access to DWI or CT perfusion, there's a, a recent study that looked at comparing the aspects data to this data. Now the aspects looks at a CT non-contrast and it looks for the abnormalities and it gives a score. If the score is low enough, that suggests that there's a big enough infarct going on. And this study showed that the aspects data overlapped with the advanced imaging from CT perfusion or DWI about 80%. So all of this to say, if you get a patient in your hospital who is beyond the four and a half hour window and you want to figure out, is this a good patient to go for mechanical thrombectomy? Either you have the advanced imaging of CT perfusion or DWI, or if you have a radiologist who can read aspects onto the CT non-con, then you can determine safely by the DAWN criteria if that patient would benefit from going to mechanical thrombectomy. Okay, excellent. Um, so, uh, Evie, there was another uh, thing that we had promised that we were going to bring up with folks uh, down the line, uh, which, uh, which we're going to have to truncate a bit. It has to do with the post-COVID phenomena. The patient had been in the ICU, and we know that there are some potential neurologic complications, sequelae that might come down the line for these patients because of the virus. We also know that a patient that's been ventilated for some time um, is, is going to have uh, all kinds of potential neurological complications. Um, I, I, I know that you've got a beautiful article up uh, that you that that talks. It's about it's by some uh, respiratory therapist that talks about rehabilitation. Um, and we're going to put it in the chapter. Um, is there anything you want to kind of highlight from that before we move on? Because we're going to go on to therapeutics next. Yeah, the, the, the big points of this is patients who make it through ICU stay and mechanical ventilation, when they get out, it's no picnic. And we know that people, we know from the ARDS literature, we know from sepsis literature, and we know from uh, literature of anybody who comes out of an ICU stay is they have difficulties. Um, they have a 75% chance of having difficulty speaking, pain with swallowing, difficulty swallowing. Um, the good news is that they do recover in about five years. Um, but the other things that we're seeing is anybody who stays in an ICU on a ventilator for greater than a week, they have weakness from disuse and atrophy. Um, they have cognitive impairment. We see this in the SARS data, we see this in the ARDS data and the sepsis data. Um, and the other thing is in the hospital, we are terrible at letting people sleep and in the ICU, it's the worst. So when somebody survives an ICU um, uh, stay and they get out, they're gonna have sleep disturbances up to six months or more from discharge. And the last thing I wanna say is in addition to all of these cognitive things, mental health is an important issue. Up to 25% of ICU survivors deal with depression and anxiety. And that was documented when these patients were being discharged into a normal world. Imagine being discharged into the world we're living in now. And the last thing I wanna say is 
we talk about the patients who go through an ICU stay, get discharged, and have all of these cognitive impairments and mental health issues. The families who are at their sides going along with them also have issues. And you think about those family members that you took, you took care of at the bedside during the whole ICU stay when you were working in the ICU and the stresses that they had. Now, we're not even letting those family members in. And that just ups the ante for their stress. And we know that family members who have patients that have been through an ICU stay have all kinds of anxiety, depression, PTSD, up to a year we're seeing that. And when those survivors are discharged, over half of them require caregiver assistance up to a year after they leave the hospital. So just much of we, what we know right now is extrapolated from the critical care literature, looking at ARDS, looking at sepsis, um, and looking over the long haul. But there's no reason to not think that our COVID survivors are, and their families are going to experience the same things. All right. So uh, that's pretty sobering. Uh, just to remind everyone that all of the articles that Evie discussed are going to be uh, annotated and in the chapter under the, uh, the neuro section. So we're keeping track of all that so we don't have to worry about each and every article. Uh, thanks, Evie. I want to move to Sean Nort uh, for our therapeutics update. Uh, Sean, uh, Associate Dean at uh, Chapman University School of Pharmacy. Uh, let's put up the, uh, the latest uh, and greatest uh, list of drugs. Where are we at? There we are, Mel. Thank you. All right. So we're going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. We had this new idea, Sean, to put some arrows and we've torpedoed uh, hydroxychloroquine here. No RCTs yet, but just nothing good, right? Well, we, we, we're, we're just the messengers. But uh, so we, there's a couple of studies that came out since we last did our last MRAP. There was one from the New England Journal of Medicine on uh, May 7th, and then one followed up on JAMA on May 11th. And what they really showed is that this drug is not making any difference and might be doing some harm. So briefly, the New England Journal article, observational study, about 1,300 patients, of which 11, uh, 800 got hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And their outcomes were intubation and or death, and there was no difference in either intubation or death. But the main outcome, this is out of Columbia University in New York City, they are no longer recommending hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin for their patients. The JAMA study is a multicenter study. It's retrospective. We don't have any RCTs for any of the stuff that we're, we're going to be presenting. But this is a, about 1,400 patients, so a little over 800 that got either hydroxychloroquine and azithro hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, or nothing. And that was the control group. And what they showed is that there was no difference in death or EKG changes, most uh, looking at torsad and QT prolongation. However, there was an increase in the group that got hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in cardiac arrest. So for us, uh, this is one of the problems we're gonna talk about, emergency use authorization. Emergency use authorization from the FDA is only makes drugs available. It is not a stamp of approval that these drugs were effective as we're seeing with this one. Right. So moving on to the IL-6 receptor inhibitors, we've got ongoing randomized control trials. We know that, uh, and we don't have any results, but we just have this blip of news about the possible deleterious effect of high sugars. It might cancel any effectiveness of this drug. What's that about, Sean? Yeah, so this one came out of it uh, pre-published or pre-peer-reviewed from MedRx IV from May 4th, uh, 2020. This is out of Italy. It's a very small study, 78 patients, and 31 had hyperglycemia defined as uh, greater than 140 or 7.7 uh, .7 millimoles per liter. And what they showed is that the tocilizumab was the IL-6 receptor antagonist they were using. Uh, its beneficial effects were negated in the presence of hyperglycemia. Now, all these patients did not have diabetes who had hyperglycemia. But this just shows me it's the sicker patients that had a stress response. And I'm not so surprised that the drug didn't work as well in this group. So, uh, but it just raises the question, if someone comes in hyperglycemic, that they might not do quite well, and that's probably because they're sicker. All right, let's move on to remdesivir. And I know that as we speak, I'm sure that some of our uh, fellow faculty are eyeing that thin, thin green arrow going upward that we kind of argued about a lot, whether or not we were gonna just make it going across or going up. I just wanna remind everyone, I think we talked about this a few weeks ago, we don't have a published paper. We have the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease data that was released. Um, and it didn't show a mortality benefit. It was a, a, a retrospective examination of groups, of course. Uh, decreased length of stay 
of four days from 15 to 11 days and a trend towards increased uh, survival, eight versus 11%. Uh, that is w the basis on which this whole train got going with this emergency use authorization. I am very concerned that we haven't seen the data and that this might be another debacle uh, along the lines of massive, massive movements and all these markets to get these meds around. What do you think, Sean? I, I agree. I mean, at best, modest results in pre-peer reviewed and unpublished data that really moved this along with this EUA from the FDA. Uh, and then there was this other kind of follow-up problem where people can get it. So what the EUA does is makes it widely available. You don't have to be part of a trial anymore. But there's t hospitals, including smaller hospitals that have tons of this stuff and major academic centers that don't. So actually the IDSA and the HIV uh, Medical Association actually wrote a letter to the vice president uh, and saying that there needs to be equitable distribution, not only to hospitals, but as Jerry had mentioned earlier, as we know, uh, people of color and people of lower socioeconomic groups are being affected greater. And it seems that they're getting perhaps maybe less access to this. So uh, that's just something to look out. If you don't have it at your place and you want to get it, you should probably work on getting it because they only have 1.5 million doses available, which sounds like a lot, but that'll only treat 140,000 patients. Excellent. So convalescent plasma, going back to our list, we have no further data for people. Uh, famotidine, we just wanted to um, bring to light the fact that this is not 20 milligrams of uh, pepsid that we're giving. What was the dose, John? It was massive, like 300... Massive doses, 120 milligrams IV Q8. So they're getting 360 milligrams per day. Uh, as you know, famotidine is well tolerated, but we are worrying that people, particularly if they have renal insufficiency, which many of the sickest patients do, they can actually seize from this. But, you know, anything you give enough, you could seize. But uh, that's we just thought it was interesting to shine the light. Uh, that's what the clinical trials are using as a dose. Okay, and moving forward, um, now there is another small thin arrow upward that people should be aware of. There was a Lancet paper recently uh, that talked about the triple combination of interferon beta, 1B, lopinavir, ritinavir, and rapavirin. Uh, briefly explain that. Yeah, so this is out of the Lancet, May 8th, 2020. And this is interesting because lopinavir, ritinavir, which is a HIV med, and then ribavirin, which works a little like remdesivir, but neither one of these really had been shown to be beneficial. But when in this study, which is, again, small patients, 126, 86 of them that got in the treatment group also got that combination, the two drugs, but also interferon beta 1B. Uh, and showed that they had the endpoint was uh, no more carriage, the nasopharyngeal carriage. So who cares, right? Clinically, we care about. But there was shorter hospital stays in nine days versus 14 and a half. We included this one because this actually got a lot of uh, press in the popular press. Yeah. Um, now, uh, Mel shocked the whole MRAP community when he made the announcement that he had now officially taken up smoking. He's now up to, what is it, Mel? Three packs a day mm -hmm. in a desperate attempt to improve his prognosis. Um, there is a legitimate basis to this nicotine ACE receptor thing, but, but, and, and, but what do you think of that? What do you well, think of this nicotine? Well, I don't know about legitimate, and we don't want to make our uh, dear friend Jerry Hoffman's head explode. But, uh, <laughs> uh, we included this because this had come up in the chat rooms, <laughs> but also I've been hearing anecdotally that people are treating patients with nicotine patches. There are no clinical trials I am aware of. But this was based out of a very small study uh, out of France. And what they did is they looked at some inpatients and outpatients and said, hey, this is interesting. A lot of people in France smoke, about 25% of the general population, but only about 5% were either inpatients or outpatients diagnosed with COVID. So they said, well, you know, nicotine can uh, decrease ACE2 receptors, so maybe smoking has a benefit, or nicotine. And that is a bizarre leap of faith. Uh, a couple of days later, uh, uh, published on ResearchGate, there was uh, not quite a meta-analysis, but they looked at 28 papers, and the challenge is that most of these papers do not say whether people were smokers, former smokers, active smokers, but of the papers they could identify, interestingly, they did show that more inpatients uh, were not smokers, but who did worse as thin patients were smokers. So don't start smoking. Don't be slapping nicotine patches on people. Uh, I, it's just too, you know, th this is, I think we were bringing up just because it just keeps coming up. It keeps it coming up. And the zinc thing there is just because it keeps coming up. I mean, it was on our diagrams that we made. It did have something to do with the right. well, it mechanism. Inhibits, but... it, it, it works similar to the remdesivir by inhibiting the RDRP, which is this uh, RNA polymerase, but you have to use very high doses. It, 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 so uh, I, I would not generally recommend zinc either. 
All righty then. Um, so I'm going to, uh, I think we're going to save uh, any questions uh, to the end because of the time considerations and move on. Thank you so much, Sean. All right. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, we have a little, a little cardiac uh, update for you. Uh, not a big one. Um, Mel, why don't you put up the, um, the actual study slide. So after the cardiac intro slide, there's just a single slide. There's a pre-release uh, of a paper that just got accepted. So um, I, wanted to, I wanted to bring uh, to people's attention this one uh, paper. There's nothing about this methodologically at all. This is just basically them getting as many cases of STEMI patients as they possibly could. They just search for everyone in the Lombardy area north of Italy. Um, and uh, they, they have found something that, of great concern to, to us, which is that of the 28 STEMI activations that they came up with, that they looked into, uh, 24 of them, STEMI was the first manifestation of COVID. Uh, and they say that none of those other people, uh, none of these people had any other flu symptoms. Now, I mean, there's just no, you know, there's no methodology here whatsoever. There's no way I don't know that those patients didn't have uh, other flu symptoms for sure. I'm not convinced of that, but I am convinced of one thing, which is that it could, it's clear to me at this point, we have enough data to say that there can be serious confusion between these two diagnoses. They could definitely present quite similarly. Um, and so this naturally brings up a lot of issues about, especially about PPE and about process. Um, and, you know, Amal brings up the important point that most places still uh, throughout the country don't have hot zones. Uh, they'll screen patients uh, to see if they're COVID patients. You know, a guy comes in clutching his chest. Do you have any flu symptoms? They screen negative. Everyone else lets their guard down. There's no PP. Everyone that goes in that room isn't thinking about it. And yet we really are seeing you know, at least in the number of cases here, a lot of doctors telling us that they've not been able to tell these apart. Um, and so that's something that everyone really needs to be aware of. And we're going to get more data on it. And we're going to, you know, we're going to get uh, uh, probably some solutions to these problems that are make it a little easier. It might have to do with testing. It might have to do um, with special processes. But at any rate, everyone needs to be aware of this. Um, what else I wanted to say about that was uh, that... Um, you know, we, we've been also getting sent to us a lot of cases, not a lot, but several cases now. I mentioned one the other day where patients come in, they've got chest pain, their tropes are up, they've got segmental wall motion abnormality. You know, they've got localized wall motion abnormality on their echoes and they go to the cath lab. Um, and in some cases they're, yeah, so Jerry, I got a thumbs up finally from Jerry, so I know I'm saying something right. Um, and uh, um, it's, it, it's a total dilemma. Um, you know, Amol's take on it is that this argues more for patients going to the cath lab. We've got to take these patients to the cath lab when we don't know what's going on so we can figure out what's going on, right? What is, how are we going to differentiate these, these myocarditis patients from these uh, STEMI patients? We don't know the answer yet, but we're going to get back to you. And it's sort of acutely, acutely uh, on our radar because we need help with this. We definitely do. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, and oh, one last point is that there's another disease that can look a lot like COVID. And we talked about it all the time, Sean, you and I, before this pandemic, which was E-Valley, which was this vape-related lung injury. And just recently, there's been several more reports of cases in California of patients coming in. And of course, in the pandemic, everyone's like, oh, it's, this, is, right. you know, this is COVID. And it turns out that there's another spike of these E-Valley cases. So just another reminder. In fact, the new definition of E-Valley, I believe, includes a requirement of a negative PCR for uh, COVID. Uh, so really, really interesting on that front. So back to you, Mel. Thanks, Stuart. Um, we're going to move away from the clinical for just a couple of minutes um, and talk with Scott Brewster. Scott is an emergency physician who is the uh, chief medical officer of Emergency Medical Associates. And as the, people are trying to think about how to get back to some level of normality while we let this thing burn through at the right pace, how can you help your hospital and your emergency department survive in a for-profit system, which will make Jerry's head explode. But Scott, give us some ideas. They're pretty interesting. And what we're seeing across our organization and now across the country is up to um, 40 to 50 percent of our volume is gone in our emergency departments and our hospitals. So we're really, really doing well in managing COVID, but we're all turning around and saying, where the heck are all our, our sick patients? And that's the sad part. Our admission rates should have gone through the roof, and they, they haven't. So you know, is COVID making people take their Lasix all of a sudden and go to dialysis and what happened to our heart attacks and our strokes that up to 50% of the patients in LA County um, are leaving against medical advice. Once the paramedics go out, 
there just because they're scared to come in. Um, what are the things that the hospital needs to do to be healthy and how we as emergency physician leaders are going to integrate with our C-suite to, to really make that happen. I mean, we're going to have to do things that we may not have thought about as emergency physicians. So an example is many of our hospitals that are beginning elective surgeries and trying to get volume back are driving everything through the emergency department. The only way to get into the hospital now will be the emergency department. In one way, that's something that we never thought we'd want to have happen. The kind of sort of uh, admission that you would have raged against the machine and screamed at a few surgeons about, you're now like, okay, we'll take exactly. those. Exactly. And, and so I, I think we are going to be asked again to be leaders, and that's going to be um, maybe thinking outside the box as we go forward. Well, and we're trying to do the same to partner with our EMS, and if someone says they are going to leave AMA, um, to be able to contact us in the emergency department so we can talk to that patient and possibly talk them into um, coming in. We need to be uh, doing press releases to make sure, just like Jess had done, um, promoting the fact that the hospital is a safe place and we can get them and safely see them for their emergent issues. If they're having chest pain, shortness of breath, weakness, do not medically isolate. The other concept, interestingly, is, is telemedicine, um, Mel. We... Um, we have a unique opportunity in emergency medicine. I think prior to this, due to HIPAA issues, due to um, regulatory issues that didn't allow us to do medical screening exams by telemedicine, um, the uh, COVID pandemic has allowed us to embrace um, telemedicine. And I think many groups and many ED physicians across the country have been doing this. Um, but it even allows us to go even further. Some of the 1135 waivers that have occurred have essentially allowed you to reach out from the emergency department and do a virtual ED visit um, with, without any repercussions. Um, and more importantly, um, to make sure that we are, again, reaching those people that are scared. If you're having chest pain, I can actually reach out to you via um, telemedicine because you're scared to come in. And I can talk to you about the fact that I have bed two available and I can safely get you there. And we're starting to see that kind of hand holding by us reaching out, getting people comfortable with coming back to the emergency department. And I think that's really one of the things that we as emergency physicians and leaders need to, need to really concentrate on. Swami's got a friend. His friend's name's Sarah. They're going to talk. Sarah, so tell us what's going on in the ICU where you are. All right, so um, I think in terms of where we are in critical care right now, um, let's start with what people more or less are beginning to agree on, which isn't that much, but there's a couple things. So first thing, what people more or less agree on is increasingly that, as we've talked about before, the decision to intubate should probably be based less on the patient's O2 set and more on how the patient looks, more on their work of breathing. And, and an aggressive early just intubate everybody immediately strategy probably actually not what we should be doing. But at the same time, we're increasingly recognizing that the mortality of COVID patients who do get intubated and ventilated is probably not as bad as we initially thought it was. So we probably shouldn't go too far the other way and say we can't possibly avoid anybody, intubate anybody at all costs. So there's probably a balance somewhere in there. Um, another thing that people are sort of coming to agreement on is that a strategy to try and delay or prevent intubation in COVID patients who are hypoxic but not acutely crumping is the idea of combining high flow nasal cannula with awake proning. Awake proning could be a whole episode on its own. Bottom line is if the patient is comfortable and setting well on their belly, fabulous. Otherwise, they can find a position of comfort. I had one patient who actually would sit, and without us giving him any direction, he would sit there and he'd watch his own O2 set, and then he would experiment with different positions and different ways of breathing and doing different things. And then he would tell me, yeah, I've noticed when I do this, my O2 set goes up, or hang on a minute, it's, it's down, so I'm going to do this so it goes up. So, you know, I think that different things work for different patients. Um, and really involving them in a meaningful way in that process is important. And then finally, the thing that also there's more or less agreement on is that these patients should be having a conservative fluid management strategy. Now, a list of people who don't agree on a lot of things, that's a much longer. So the topics that people don't agree on, um, it all comes down to, is COVID basically just ARDS or not? There's increasing controversy over this idea of the L and the H subtypes. A lot of people are still using it. Some people are saying that doesn't make any sense. But most importantly, once intubated, 
Should we just be using the ARDS protocols that we have, that we know work in ARDS patients? The low tidal volume, high PEEP strategies, should we be doing that? And increasingly, I'm just seeing that people are coming out more and more vocally in either the COVID is ARDS camp or the COVID is not ARDS camp. Personally, I am sort of very firmly in the camp of, I don't know the answer, but I suspect that the answer, when we finally figure it out, will be complicated. Um, Sarah, I think, I think that yeah. I think one of the things that, that you've you've said a couple of times that maybe we're not grasping well enough is it's not all or nothing. It's not yeah. all ARDS or all the oh, other yeah. type. It, it's it's patients exist on this spectrum. And For some sure. of the patients in the unit are not in ARDS, but they still oh, need yeah. to be in the unit. And I, and I think we have to embrace that. It's just not black and white. I think so. And I think that like even just starting from the question of ARDS or not ARDS is a false dichotomy because even ARDS turns out not to be all that straightforward when you try and really define it. And it turns out that it's not all that homogeneous in the first place. And I think that you're right. I really suspect that COVID is a much more complicated heterogeneous disease than we currently appreciate. And whether we can successfully break that down into these more discrete clusters of subtapes and whether those will turn out to be the H and L or something else, I don't know. But this is really highlighted, I think, in this really interesting paper that just came out of Boston on the pulmonary pathophysiology of 60 some patients mechanically ventilated in their ICU with COVID. So what was interesting is that the conclusion of the article basically reads that it looks like more like ARDS than not. But if you actually look at their data, they reported everything in medians, not means, presumably at least partially reflecting the fact that there was a decent amount of variability in these patients. In terms of the compliance question, the lung compliance question, if you look at actually all the individual data points, you see that there was this one handful who had normal or near normal compliance. There was another handful that started out with terrible compliance and then kind of everything in between. And so where does that leave us? Because again, we can't say tomorrow, well, we're just not going to manage the COVID events because we don't know how. We can't do that. Um, in terms of where I think that leaves us, as much as I know that we would all like to have some kind of cookbook style guideline that anybody, regardless of level of expertise, could follow, I just, I don't think that we're there yet. Unfortunately, I still think that the best strategy for mechanical ventilation in COVID patients right now is continually customizing the ventilator settings for each individual patient based on your evolving understanding of their particular lung mechanics. And it's interesting because if you look at the Boston data, it kind of seems like that's what they were doing. Because if you look at the variability in management, it was quite significant. So for example, the PEEPs that they were using, which is this big contentious issue right now, on day one when these patients got intubated, the PEEPs ranged from five to 20. So I think variability in patients, variability between patients, and variability in management is just going to be something that we don't have to like, but we probably have to accept. Sarah, it just seems like it comes back over and over again to ratios of docs to patients, nurses to patients. We mentioned this with yeah. Peter W. a couple of weeks back. To individualize care, you can't be taking care of 16 intubated patients. No. It just doesn't work that way. One of the things that is part of good critical care management that a lot of people ask about is anticoagulation and what we should be doing. Now, if I send any patient to the ICU, we know they're going to get prophylactic VTE therapy, unless, of course, mm -hmm. they have a pulmonary embolism, a little bit different. But what should we be doing as far as therapeutic versus prophylactic? We have this Mount Sinai data that shows, or at least what they reported is they did therapeutic uh, anticoagulation on a bunch of patients, and those patients did better. That's an association. It's not causality. And they didn't compare it to prophylactic. So when if I call you, Sarah, I have a COVID patient I intubated. I'm sending them up to your unit, but we don't have a bed. So it's going to be with me for a while. What are you asking for as far as anticoagulation? Yeah, so I think that, I mean, clearly everybody needs to be on prophylactic dump. The question really is, who should we be therapeutically? How should we be therapeutically? And whether those, again, are the two dichotomous options and whether an intermediate strategy might be appropriate. Um, I am increasingly anticoagulating more people rather than fewer um, because it's increasingly coming home to me, just watching my patients clinically, how dramatic their coagulopathy can be. I had a patient who um, basically had an ischemic limb because she had arterial clots, and this was on prophylactic anticoagulation. And in addition, there's this really interesting story about COVID evolving, that there's a hypothesis that maybe, maybe we need to be switching from our sort of ventilation-centric view of respiratory failure to a perfusion 
pathocentric view of respiratory failure in COVID. And maybe really the pathophysiology is centering more around the idea of microvascular pulmonary disease. And recently this Lancet article that coined the term diffuse pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy, which could have a lot of interesting clinical implications. So for me, if somebody has a lot of risk factors for clotting, just as any patient would, I am tending more towards fully or maybe doing intermediate dose anticoagulation as long as they don't have a ton of risk factors for bleeding. So again, I don't know the answer to this, but my personal practice is I'm tending towards more anticoagulation rather than less. Is that one study out of Mount Sinai enough for us all to do this and for me to say everybody should be doing this? No. Again, I think probably personalized. You can take a look at the labs, the risk factors of the patient. And certainly if the patient starts to clot things, if they're clotting their CRT circuit, if they develop a DVT, I would very quickly move to full anticoagulation. But I think also here, there is going to be a gray in between area. And so once again, individualized care for so. each patient, no flat yeah. answers. You can give me nothing to say, here's the protocol really. and just do it. It's, it's tough. This is hard. And that's why we need good intensivists. We need lots of good intensivists. And as emergency physicians, when you're in the surge, you need to really up your game and learn from the intensivists of what they're doing and what they're thinking about so that we can bring that to the bedside, especially when we're keeping patients for a long period of time, but hopefully we won't be doing that. Now we had an article that we were gonna touch on this immune mechanisms of pulmonary intravascular co coagulation. I challenged you during the week to explain this to Mel and I in five minutes. I think initially we said seven minutes, but I'm cutting it down to five. We're gonna, for now, we're gonna hold off on it because I think it, it's really gonna take a significant amount of time for us to work through this. This was not a simple article. I read it uh, 19 times and some of that was because I fell asleep while reading it, but, but some of it was because there were big words I had to Google. And then I had to ask Stuart what those words meant. So uh, this is going to be a tough one, but maybe we can revisit this and we want to give some time for some questions on pregnancy. So Mel, I'm going to turn it back over to you. If we have time at the end, I'm sure Sarah can take some questions. And if not, we'll save it for next week. Great. Thanks, Swami. Um, yeah, we will, after we've finished uh, this next section, do a couple more questions, bring back Jerry for a couple of points. But uh, I was actually watching CNN yesterday and they had three pregnant ER docs working shifts and um, I thought, you know, this would be a good time to find out what's new in COVID and pregnancy. Heidi James, who runs our Right on Prime part of the program, has got a friend, Penny Wilson, to discuss. Hey, thanks so much, Mel. Uh, yeah, here we're here with Penny Wilson. Penny, you uh, came to Canada via Australia, so you're an expat living in lovely, scenic uh, Victoria, British Columbia. And by training, you're a GP obstetrician. So we're thrilled to have you here for a pregnancy update. Nice to be here, Heidi. So let's jump right into it, Penny. How big of a concern is COVID-19 for our pregnant patients? So this is something that we were initially very worried about because we know that influenza is more complicated in pregnancy and the previous coronavirus outbreaks like SARS and MERS had very high maternal mortality rates of somewhere in the region of 23 to 25%. But the early data that was coming out about COVID in pregnancy didn't seem to be anywhere near that bad. Now, the best data that we have now comes from a UK cohort study, which was just released in the last couple of days in a preprint, prepublication format uh, that looked at 427 COVID positive women uh, who were pregnant and admitted to hospitals in the UK. Um, and out of those patients, 9% uh, needed critical care. And there were, there were five deaths, uh, which equated to a case fatality rate of 1.2%. Uh, so that is really keeping in line with the general population. Okay, so that information is somewhat reassuring. Um, in your reading, have you found that there are any risk factors that predispose women to having more severe disease? Compared to the comparison group, the patients who had COVID positive in pregnancy were more likely to be over the age of 35, uh, to be overweight or obese, to have uh, pre-existing medical comorbidities or to be from a minority ethnicity. So again, these risk factors are uh, reflective of the general risk factors in, in the non-pregnant population. And these are also risk factors that we often see associated with higher maternal risks in pregnancy anyhow, right, Penny? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, of course, when we're dealing with a pregnant patient, we're really doing dealing with two patients, the pregnant woman and also the fetus. So I'm hoping you can cover, touch on maybe some of the complications that affect the mom and, and the fetus. 
Yeah, so the most common complication that we're seeing in the uh, obstetric uh, perspective is preterm birth. And now the vast majority of that is actually iatrogenic. So patients are being delivered early because there's either maternal compromise or fetal distress that is warranting early birth. Uh, the rates of spontaneous preterm birth are actually very low. Now, the other thing that we're seeing is significantly higher cesarean section rates compared to normal. And again, that's due to largely uh, the increased risk of the increased rates of maternal and fetal uh, uh, illness that require um, early delivery that doesn't uh, isn't appropriate for uh, labor induction or vaginal delivery. Okay, so based on that, do we have any idea about neonatal outcomes? How do these babies fare? The news here is generally pretty good. Most of the babies are being born in good condition and not requiring resuscitation and uh, not really needing any extra assistance after birth. There is a small rate of COVID positivity amongst the newborns of around 5% and most of that is mild disease. Um, now the rate of admission to NICU is higher than that, but it's generally not due to uh, infant uh, COVID disease per se, but it is due to complications of maternal illness and prematurity. So it's more reflective of maternal disease rather than uh, newborn disease. Um, now, uh, there is also a perinatal mortality rate. So that is comprised of intrauterine death and uh, newborn death, and that rate is around 2%. And it appears from the international literature that that rate is increased amongst the most critically unwell mothers, which is uh, unsurprising. Okay, and at 2%, that's far higher than we'd like it to be, but not as high as uh, I think a lot of us were worried it could be. Mm. Yeah. Now, every day when I opened up my email, I get a question from a listener about vertical transmission. What's the, what's the scoop on that right now? Yeah, again, the early early data looked pretty good. Uh, they did some early studies on maternal body fluids that were all negative, so we were all pretty happy about that. But as time has gone on, the evidence is looking more and more suggestive of uh, vertical transmission being a possibility. Now, the reasons that we have to believe that is that of those newborns who've been uh, coming up swab positive, um, about half of those in the UK group uh, was coming up positive in the first 12 hours of life. And in the last couple of days, there's been a case report published where a newborn was actually positive on a nasopharyngeal swab at the time of birth. Um, we have seen reports of the SARS-CoV-2 virus isolated in amniotic fluid, placental tissue, and also in maternal feces. So that gives us a bit of an idea about the potential uh, routes of transmission or the sources of transmission. And uh, there have also been three cases uh, where they have isolated SARS-CoV-2 IgM in the uh, cord blood. Now, remembering that the cord blood is fetal circulation and IgM is a large protein, it's not known to cross the placenta. So that raises question marks about whether those infants had intrauterine infection. But interestingly, none of those infants went on to develop uh, positive nasopharyngeal swabs or any clinical disease. So there's lots of questions. Uh, there's no certainty. So I'd say at this stage, we don't have conclusive evidence of vertical transmission, uh, but the evidence is certainly getting more and more suggestive. Okay, we'll be sure to check back with you on this topic down the road. And let's switch gears for a minute and talk, to, and talk about management of our laboring patients. And as I understand from my OBS and family practice OBS colleagues, this really starts even before they walk through the door with screening for COVID symptoms. Yeah, so of course, every patient who's entering a healthcare facility needs to be uh, screened for symptoms. And if they come positive on that screening, they need uh, swabbing as well. Now, the question is around uh, universal screening or whether asymptomatic patients should also be screened. So it, the hospitals in New York and London that have implemented universal screening have found asymptomatic uh, positive swab rates of around 90%, 9-0. Uh, so for every one uh, symptomatic patient, there may be nine more that are asymptomatic. So that has implications for infection control and for areas that have high community spread, universal screening is certainly something that should be considered. Okay. Now, once we have a patient in labor and that patient does have COVID, um, how should we manage them? So the medical management of COVID positive pregnant patients is the same principles as for a non-pregnant patient. So uh, escalation to critical care is required and following the guidelines there. Now, there is that extra uh, layer of complication when you have two patients, the mother and the fetus. So there may come a point where either the maternal or the fetal condition warrants early delivery. And that conversation is gonna be uh, between the obstetric team, 
the critical care team and the neonatology team as to the timing of that delivery. Okay. What's the latest information on PPE in pregnancy? Because uh, specifically in labor, because the last time I attended a birth, it was not exactly a clean, sterile event. Yeah, there was a lot of debate early on as to whether a uh, second stage of labor, so the pushing part, uh, is considered an aerosol generating procedure, uh, given that there's all the kind of huffing and puffing involved with it. Um, we don't have any direct data on this, but the kind of consensus at the moment is that it is not. So the recommended PPE for delivery and labor is droplet precautions. Now, having said that, labor and delivery is a time where healthcare workers spend prolonged period of time with patients. So typically a nurse or midwife will spend a lot of face-to-face -face time supporting that laboring woman. And then when it comes time to delivery, uh, staff are really up close with the patient and um, there for the duration of that um, delivery as well. So um, recommended PPE is droplet, but you know high risk due to uh, length of time, duration with patients and proximity. To, so that really needs to be taken into consideration. Okay, I have one last question for you, Penny, and that's on the topic of breastfeeding. Uh, breastfeeding in the context of a COVID positive mom, and this has been a really hot topic. What are the current recommendations? Yeah, there was another controversial one. Early on, the recommendations were for uh, infants to be separated from their COVID positive mothers to reduce the risk of transmission to the baby. Um, but as we know, uh, there are risks with that approach as well. So disruption of bonding and establishment of breastfeeding uh, can have long-term consequences. So we've seen case reports now of uh, babies that were kept with their mothers um, and with appropriate precautions like hand washing and face masks have been able to breastfeed successfully uh, without causing uh, transmission there. Uh, so now the recommendations are moving towards a shared decision model between the healthcare team and the patient to decide uh, based on the, the pros and cons whether the baby will be separated or stay with the family. Okay, perfect. That's great. Thank you, Penny. So just to sum up what you've said, it looks like pregnant patients are not at higher risk of COVID-related morbidity or mortality than the average population, but there are some complications that are obviously unique to this group. And vertical transmission, well, the jury's still out there, but it looks like a strong possibility. And those of us who work with laboring women, we should make sure that our patients are properly screened and use the, the correct PPE during the birthing process. Thanks very much, Heidi. Okay, and with that, it's uh, back to you, Mel. Thanks, uh, really fascinating stuff. Um, before we do our last video and, and sort of end tonight, I want to give Jerry a chance to come back in and uh, tell us what he thinks about all these pre-print things that are being sent out in the world. This is a good thing and this is a bad thing. What are your thoughts, Jerry? Thanks, Mel. Um, first of all, let me say thank you for having me. This has really been a pleasure. It's such a great group you have here and you're doing a really really good service to to, uh, to be doing this. I did want to come in very briefly when I started hearing about these, uh, these studies. You know, uh, many of your listeners know that I spent 30 years, 30 some odd years uh, doing every month reviewing the dozens of articles for EMA. And uh, that gave me the opportunity to have, I don't know, 300,000 uh, <laughs> times where we saw articles claiming that something was fabulous and then it turned out it wasn't so fabulous and then it turned out it was actually harmful. And that was not just true of retrospective studies or small studies or poorly done studies, but it was also true of randomized trials. And it was true of studies that were repeated and were positive 19 times. And then it turned out they were wrong, like the famous magnesium for heart disease, not to mention things like uh, type uh, uh, 1C antiarrhythmics that were fabulous until they actually ended up killing lots of people. So I just want to caution everybody that this, this new uh, mode that we're in now, where the New England Journal publishes uh, studies of four people observation about them from, from their grandmother uh, as a hot off the press, brand new thing. This is crazy. And um, it's taking us to places that are really, really dangerous. I always used to joke that when something new came up, some new wonderful thing came up, I, I always say, I don't know, I really don't know anything about this, but I'll bet a lot of money that it turns out to be wrong because almost all the time, those little silly things did turn out to be wrong. So while it would be great if one of these drugs or combinations actually had some utility, I think we, we'd all be very well advised to remain extremely skeptical. Almost all of them are certain not to be useful and probably harmful. And 
we're unlikely to figure out which one, if there is one that is useful, we're not going to figure it out because this is such a terrible process. So I just want to remind your listeners, let's, I understand why we, why you feel the need to tell people about what's hot off the presses, but I hope that every time you do, you will emphasize that this is not terribly meaningful and not reliable and unlikely to prove to be true. Yeah, it's a great point, Jerry. We try and say that every time. That's a preprint. It's not peer-reviewed. This is very dangerous, but we've got to talk about it because you're seeing it on the news and we say it Absolutely. over and over again. I understand that, Mel. It's just it's really important to keep stressing this. And we're seeing bad effects from it. You know, hydroxychloroquine is only right. the first. There's going to be lots of others. And somebody will make a lot of money off of them, but uh, we won't be better as a community because of it. You know, I watched you on emergency medical abstracts for 30 years, and it was actually stunning how often stuff that looked like it worked, even in pretty good studies, over time with better studies, didn't work. It's really kind of, and it took decades and, to find out. And I was going to say, sometimes the, the duration of time that this, that a particular uh, feeling was, uh, you know, uh, right, universal the throughout the community, it, it, sometimes 20, 30 years, look at hormones uh, uh, in uh, and there are famous, uh, postmenopausal there are... women and, yeah. And there are studies which show that it's, it takes almost two nanoseconds to adopt a new treatment and 20 years to get rid of it when it turns out to be really harmful. So, and what, and what Jerry's saying, actually, just to, to, to feed on that, we, we're actually seeing everything that you're describing in a miniature form during this pandemic. Basically, we're seeing a microcosm of that, and it's almost like we can't help it. In our you know, the one system, thing I want to impossible. say, though, the one thing I really have a lot of hope for is is injecting lie. I think that might actually be a good one because, you know, I'm no longer a doctor actively all the time. But but, you know, I have pretty good instincts. Oh, Jerry. don't do it. <laughs> so on that point, uh, we are going to show you a, one last video because it turns out that um, we have this science podcast for kids and families. And uh, it was we finished it a couple of years ago. And it was based around the idea of a pandemic and teaching science. And it's just kind of funny that, you know, two years later, here's a pandemic. So uh, f let me thank all of the people that are involved in putting this production together. You have no idea how complicated it is. Graham and CZ and Ed, all of these people putting this together. It's very difficult. We probably won't be doing another one for a couple of weeks. Um, but we will be continually updating the textbook. We will be continually doing audio updates and video updates as uh, we get more news. But the live one, we might take uh, another couple of weeks off. So having said that, everybody, we'll be in the chat room chatting afterwards uh, with some smart people. And uh, let's show this little short. And uh, Jerry, I think you're going to want to see this one. Here we go. See you soon. These two words sound similar, but actually have nothing to do with each other at all. Pneumonia. Pneumonia is basically an inflammation of the lungs, usually from infection. When you get pneumonia, the air sacs in your lungs fill with fluid, and there's inflammation, and there's pus. But pneumonia is not a pathogen-specific disease. You can get pneumonia from all types of pathogens. You can have a parasitic pneumonia, you can have a fungal pneumonia, you can even have a thing called chemical pneumonia. If you breathe in a gas, it can produce a very similar inflammation. But the most common is bacterial pneumonia caused by... Wait for it. That's right, bacteria. Or viral pneumonia caused by, yes, viruses. Like the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This virus in particular likes to infect the lungs. So that's why a lot of COVID-19 patients have pneumonia. Ammonia. Ammonia is an organic compound with this chemical structure. Nitrogen with three hydrogen atoms. It's used in cleansers, it smells terrible, and it's what the upper clouds on Saturn are made of. What about treating pneumonia with ammonia? Ow! So, ammonia, pungent, horrible smelling cleanser, clouds on Saturn. Pneumonia, inflammation of the lungs, pus and fluids, really bad, caused by any type of pathogen, even chemicals. This message brought to you by Saturn's Clouds, the household cleanser that does the job but smells awful. And that's how you know it's working. All right, if you want to know more about pathogens, check out Season 1, Episode 2. Don't forget to subscribe here. And if you want to start the whole Season 1 from the beginning, you know, because it's a story, and it starts with a beginning and it has a middle and an end, then click on this little guy over here, huh? Oh, and by the way, ammonia is great for Saturn and cleaning windows, but getting it inside of you is really bad. Don't be an idiot. 
So Shabam, the podcast, you should really go and check it out. It's pretty cool. We're on Gallery View. Here's all of our wonderful speakers tonight. I want to thank them all for their time. It takes a lot of effort to do this. We meet multiple times and are coming up to these things. Again, we'll be in the chat room answering some of these questions. And uh, we will see you all soon. Be safe out there. You're going to get it. It's going to happen. But we just don't want to all get it at the same time, right? I think that's what I learned tonight. Talk to you soon. Herbert out.